one of the interesting things here is that the borders that we're talking about, of course, aren't real. I mean, they are all artificially constructed. And so in those spaces where there are um, uh, national borders, there are animals that traverse those lines all the time. Um, but we don't notice them because they don't come under those kind of protocols because we've just made up the concept of borders. So, hello everybody. Um, welcome to the Anthrozoology podcast, episode um, five, Animals as Immigrants. Hey, I'm Michelle Sudlowski with the University of Exeter. I am an anthrozoologist who studies human-elephant relationships. My current focus is on captive elephant welfare in Nepal. Hi, I'm Chris and I'm doing my PhD through Exeter University. Um, and my project focuses on free roaming cats and cat-human relationships in urban environments. And I'm Tom Maiello. Uh, I too am a PhD student at the University of Exeter. Um, and I've been studying the intersection of speciesism and racism um, in a variety of different contexts. Hi, I am Jess. I'm also a PhD student at Exeter University. Uh, I am studying a, well, I'm doing a multi-species approach to uh, the study of human civet interactions. Uh, and I'm looking at this in the context of globalization and commodity chains. Hi, and I'm Sarah, and I'm doing a PhD um, with Exeter University, and my focus is on um, shark-human interactions. And I'm trying to approach um, the research topic using sensory and transspecies ethnography. Okay, so today we're talking about animals as immigrants, and um, just so happens is one of my future immigrants is on my knee at the moment. Uh, so I just want to start with a quick story that's happening as we speak. Um, I, I um, co-run an animal rescue in Saudi Arabia, and at the moment we have five cats being um, transferred from our rescue uh, to another rescue in um, Holland where they'll be rehomed. And um, we go through an agent because the stress involved in making sure all the paperwork is right, making sure every step in the logistics chain is, um, is, it is tied up correctly is very difficult. And we, I've actually tried it before to try and do it on my own and it's, it's just too much. So we, we pay quite a lot, but the stress is taken off our shoulders. However, um, it seems that our current um, set of immigrants or emigrants from here, immigrants into Holland, is, uh, has hit a problem. And it's, it's a problem that um, often, uh, often affects many immigrants, human or non-human animal immigrants around the world, and probably plant immigrants as well. Um, and that is paperwork. So somebody has decided at the uh, Charles de Gaulle um, customs end that they want um, every page of um, an, a, a document called Annex 4 stamped and signed. This has never been requested at all in any other, um, any other uh, from any other European country. And these animals are now stuck in a liminal space between exported from um, Saudi Arabia or emigrating from Saudi Arabia and imported into Holland. So um, I, this is, uh, it's very stressful, but it's been being dealt with by the agent, thank goodness. And I know that I'm not the only one in this position at the moment, because somebody else has said they're having exactly the same problem with Charles de Gaulle at the moment. And I know, for example, Chris has had a problem with her paperwork, with her and co, co-emigrant immigrant from one country to another. Do you want to tell us about it, Chris? <laughs> yeah, this was over 10 years ago now. So I bought my, my two cats from, with me from, from the US. Um, and we, we hired a company to deal with the paperwork because we knew that there were um, a lot of sort of specific things that needed to be done in the right order, especially bringing them to the, the UK. So they had to be microchipped and registered before their first rabies vaccination. And all this had to be um, sort of recorded. So they, they had to have been immunized at least five months before travel and then the the documents themselves to the the paperwork the equivalent to their pass 
um, passports and everything. So we hired a company to deal with this. It was a little bit more expensive than if we'd have done it ourselves. But we'd heard you get the paperwork wrong and they go straight into a five month quarantine at the UK border, um, which, which we'd have to pay for, as well as the obvious stress that it would cause the cat. So we, we hired the company to avoid all that. Um, and basically they, they screwed up. Um, I can't actually remember the name of the company and um, yeah, maybe I shouldn't name them anyway. Um, but basically, um, yeah, they, they didn't deal with the problems. Um, and the problem was the, there was a bit of paperwork um, that the Boston vet had to sign and then the original copy had to be stamped by the, um, the, 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 the incoming people at DEFRA or ever dealt with it. Um, so they, we got in the situation, they'd landed, they'd been okay by the UK vets, everything had been cleared based on photocopies of the paperwork, which, which they had, but they couldn't release them until this um, particular document was there, physically there. Um, and so the Boston vet was blaming, the, said they signed it, but the airline obviously didn't want to, to take the blame, so they were blaming the vet. So this backwards and forwards, your fault, your fault, um, we're stopping the actual document appearing um, and the, the, the clock was ticking. So we had like 48 hours to try and find another way to get them out before they went into the five month um, uh, quarantine. Um, but the key, the key point was that, yeah, we had to, to sort of deal with this emergency and pay extra costs to get somebody on the, the UK end to figure out how to get them a, a European pass, passport. So we paid a ton of extra money um, to get them their EU passport so that they could be released after spending yeah, nearly 48 hours post landing. I was thinking that that kind of, um, that kind of immigration is like a, akin to family reunification in the human terms. Um, I don't know if anybody else has got any other examples, like for example, um, Jess, maybe you've got some examples you were saying that you work, used to work for a zoo. Yeah, so I used to be a registrar. Um, so I was a zookeeper, but also a registrar. It was a very, very small zoo. So whereas the larger zoos might have a, a registrar or a curator that works alongside the registrar, or they might just have the curator is responsible for, for that. Um, it was yeah, very, very small scale zoo. So I was zookeeping full time, but then I was also the registrar responsible for inputting all of the data for every single animal, whether, you know, they were a bit sick that day or whether we were having, I don't know, whether an animal had died or had been born. Um, all of that had to be input into this uh, global database that we call ZIMS. So that's Zoological Information Management Systems. And part of my role with that was that if we needed a lot of our animals, for example, were part of uh, international breeding programs and we had some very rare species, so it was paramount to include the, the best genetics as possible to maintain a viable population. But that meant that if we had an animal that maybe had grown up and needed to be separated from the parents and go off to breed elsewhere, it was my responsibility to phone the stud bookkeeper for that particular species. They would tell me which zoos on the planet also contain the same, the same species or the same subspecies that was also genetically unrelated enough that it would continue um, a very a very healthy line. So I found that I was always in this very weird liminal position where I was faced with an animal that I had in my care, or at least in the zoo's care, and then I was having to phone up a country or a zoo in a country that I may not speak the language. So there is automatically that barrier. So then there would be a formal agreement that they would loan us their, their male to come and breed with our female, or we would send our female to their male or vice versa. There was that element. Then once that was agreed, I had to then do all the paperwork. But with the paperwork, I had to create the uh, consignment. So we had a, a company that we would use, that most zoos would use, where they would collect the animal and they would be the ones, the driver would be the ones to care for the animal en route. They're the ones that would need to um, understand all the different legislation, transport legislations for each country. And because we dealt with a lot of animals in Europe, we would try and do it as cheaply as possible, being a small zoo, and as quickly as possible for the animal welfare benefit, 
But then we would have, say, three different species being collected from three different zoos in three different countries. And we were trying to get one consignment, so one driver, one vehicle, to go to the first zoo, pick up that monkey, then go across the border into the different country to go to another zoo to collect maybe five or six birds, and then would go across to the next country and pick up the next animal. Um, so yeah, it's an extremely complicated process and you're up to your eyeballs in all this paperwork and all these different, some of the species would be listed on sites appendix one, but then in a different country, they might be considered to be a site appendix two. And it's like trying to work out, well, hang on, which, which paperwork do I need? Who do I need to talk to? And it's unbelievably stressful. And I think when it's, you're, you're very much invested in the care of these animals as well. And it might be a particular animal that you've become close to over your career and you're sending them somewhere else. You're suddenly putting that responsibility into the hands of someone you've never met before, dealing with legislation that you may not have come into contact with before. And you're not there for that journey. So I think it puts a real strain on that human animal bond. Um, and I can really appreciate how impactful that would be for someone like you, Chris, that had had their own animal in that kind of liminal place where it's like they're not quite a member of one country, but they're not quite a member of the next country yet. So where are they? Where do they exist? Um, and yeah, that can be really, really stressful from an administrative point of view, as well as from a uh, animal care point of view. And interesting too that all of these immigrations that we're talking about so far are forced immigrations as it were that we we don't have animals that are trying to go to different places of their own accord these are all a human human based forced uh, immigrations and immigrations i think that's a really interesting point and it's something that i was thinking about um in the lead up to this podcast i was thinking well so many people on the planet, so many humans on the planet are immigrants because they have been forced to be displaced. And actually, most of the animals on the planet that we see in zoos or we have in the pet trade, they're also forced as be being displaced by humans. So there's a huge amount of... Um, yeah, there's a lot of ways I think that you can compare both humans and animals. Um, but maybe, Tom, you could input about what that means from a maybe a racial stance. Can that comparison be made? Well, yeah. And I think one of the interesting things here is that the borders that we're talking about, of course, aren't real. I mean, they are all artificially constructed. And so in those spaces where there are um, uh, national borders, there are animals that traverse those lines all the time. Um, but we don't notice them because they don't come under those kind of protocols because we've just made up the concept of borders. But at the same time, because we've made them up, most of the quote unquote immigration that's going to happen is going to be forced because we have policed that to such a degree and that's, again, that's also really true of humans. I mean, in the United States, we certainly have that problem now with um, uh, an overt kind of anti-immigrant leadership that is specifically focused on everyone that's below the Texas border in the United States and doesn't want any of them in and is kind of stopping all of that. And... I think to, to understand that completely, we need to under we need to kind of go through the concept of artificially constructing those borders in the first place. My point of reference for that is the United States. And you know, when when our country over here was was founded, we had what was called the open range, where uh, uh, everything was open, everybody could do anything they wanted. That was the big draw of coming over here. We were a cultural backwater, but we had space and you could have land and you could do all of those things. But starting in the late 17th century and moving forward, we started 
creating fencing laws, which kind of started defining people's property, um, which kept animals in confined spaces and didn't allow them an open range anymore. And then as property rights developed, that only kind of developed from there. Then we had new laws that meant you had to fence in your plant, your gardens, because animals would try to move into those spaces to eat people's um, uh, crops. And that would cause a variety of lawsuits. And they didn't know how, it wasn't the medieval time, so they didn't know how to sue a pig. So they had to create these um, these laws to, to stop animals motion. I mean, it was all designed to police the motion of animals to stop human lawsuits against one another. And as that developed up through the late 19th century, we completely ended the concept of the free range and created all of these laws that artificially stop animals from going places. And so every time an animal traduces one of those lines, whether it be a national border or a fence, I mean, they are essentially, by the way we have constructed these ideas, an immigrant. I mean, um, uh, two weeks ago, uh, one of my pigs uh, got out of the fence and um, was walking around the neighborhood. And it was very different than if a dog got out and was running around the neighborhood because this particular pig is a wild boar, uh, which is technically illegal to have and uh, an animal that is shot often, uh, hunted often. And the vast majority of people in the place where I live, if they saw a wild boar, they would just shoot her. So, the consequences for that particular traducing of a border became incredibly serious. And we freaked out and were running around trying to find, she had, actually hadn't gone very far, but it just demonstrated that even in, even in immigrations and border crossings that are relatively mundane compared to the stack of paperwork that you have to do whenever you're trying to bring pets from one country to another, there can still be real danger because we have so built up these artificial constructions in our mind of what a border is that um, uh, it puts real consequences, even on those who don't acknowledge our social constructions. Well, back to your comment about the fences and the you know artificial keeping animals in and out. Uh, I'm originally from Colorado and we had an issue there with losing uh, pronghorn antelope because when people started fencing in their ranches pronghorn antelope do not jump over fences and there was the expectation that that it wouldn't interfere with the passage of these antelope but it did they don't know how to jump over fences and so they had to come up with the solution of putting split rail fences because they'll go through the fence but they won't go over the fence and so uh, after they started to lose these populations of pronghorn they got smart with these uh, split rail fences in. But then what they've discovered is that if you have a area where you've had a fence for a long time or a road or a bridge, any sort of a physical structure, even if you remove that physical structure or bury the pipeline, whatever you do, herd animals, like a lot of uh, the deer and antelope species still won't cross that barrier. So even though it, it physically no longer exists uh, just like with the Iron Curtain, they found this when when the, the fencing fell from the Iron Curtain, those uh, those um, herds will not cross that barrier. So they'll come right up to it, turn around and, and go away because for generations they've they've learned to avoid that area. So it's interesting, even though those those mental barriers became physical barriers, they've now returned to being mental barriers and they're still getting in the way. And that makes me think of um, it's forced migration but due to, um, uh, due to environmental factors, climate change, uh, that is meaning that um, certain fish, um, including sharks, are moving into, are you moving with the, 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 um, the warmer waters up into, um, up into, for example, the UK waters, there's been more sightings of, of sharks up there. And so culturally, 
that uh, countries have to completely change their minds, or maybe they don't, about how they think about um, uh, certain certain non-human animals. Um, so they become transgressive, but without really knowing that they're transgressive because they're just swimming in their in their their own umwelt, their own their own environmental bubble, and and yet we're looking at, at upon them and 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 making judgments about uh, about the immigrants and there's quite a few parallels with um with non-human animals judgments on non-human animal immigrants and human animal immigrants um and one thing i was thinking about was the migrant animals that migrate obviously go somewhere then they um they they leave at some point we, we don't seem to have a problem with those but i was wondering if it's because they leave and so they don't feel like they're a constant threat or whether it's because they remind us of certain times of the year, for example, when swallows appear in the sky or geese sleep for the winter or something like that. I don't know if anybody's got any thoughts on that. I've got a, uh, yeah, a, a thought on that. So um, recently, um, wild birds across the UK, so birds that are migrating across the path of, of the UK. And this happened a few years ago and it happened again this year. Um, bird flu is now on the rise. So these migratory birds are actually flying across the trajectory of uh, the UK. And where they are coming into contact with um, captive bird populations, and I'm specifically thinking of poultry farms and zoo collections, where we are housing a vast quantity of, of animals. Um, they're actually picking up these diseases that are carried from these migratory species. So this becomes very problematic because in the one sense we want these, we want to promote these migratory species because they represent a lot for conservation and, and species ecology, but at the same time, they are an intrinsic risk to the captive populations. So who's at, who's at fault there? Which boundary has been, has been yeah. traversed? Um, but yeah, it's, a, it's really interesting to think that in one sense, we have this really beautiful poetic idea of migratory species and being one with nature. And actually they're coming into contact with our captive populations, which causes all sorts of, of legal and moral and health problems. Well, that just makes me think we've made certain animals captive and we're actually now thinking nature stop doing what you're doing because we are you know because we actually want control and we need to, everything to be nice and clean and pristine and etc that, that comes back to this idea and i think this is very much uh, emblematic of uh, human exceptionalism is that we we create these borders we create these names and we create them both physically with fences and walls uh, and enclosures, but we also create them uh, figuratively in as much as, well, you are a domestic species, so you yeah. must be in a domestic environment, you must be contained. Um, and when you were talking about transgressive animals before, it got me thinking about um, the case study of a mouse uh, and a mouse being in, in a lab I think it was a study by Herzog, but I'd have to have to check. And it was this really eloquent essay that's explaining transgressive animals and how it's all kind of imaginary, these, these borders, um, but they are also defined by physical spaces. And he takes the case of a mouse in a lab and how the, the mouse in the lab environment that's being used for experiments that will help I don't know, create the next vaccine for humans or, you know, progressing our own house is seen as, has, you know, it's seen as this, um, this hero and it's, it's for the greater good and it's helping humanity. And so in return for that sacrifice, they get intrinsic rights or basic rights. Um, you know, they have to be given a suitable diet. They have to, their needs have to be met to a certain extent. As soon as that mouse falls and it touches the floor, it's transgressed in its moral status. So it's no longer a hero of me medical research. It no longer has those basic rights. 
And at that point, it hits the floor. It's not enclosed. So then it's a pest. And at that point, we're able to poison them or to stamp them on them. Uh, we just need to get rid of that risk in the environment. So at that point, it's not just the lives of the animals that are going from one border to the other that are being dictated by those borders. It's also how we allow them to die as well. Absolutely. I mean, there's a there's a really good paper by Sarah Crowley called, um, I don't know the exact title, but it's, out of, it's Camels, Out of Space, Out of Time. And so the camels have been taken as immigrants into Australia. And um, and it makes me think of the labour force, you know, um, and f- forced and re- re- requested human labour from one country to the other. So obviously the camels are, are, are forced. And um, they basically transgress uh, as we as we develop um, different methods of, of locomotion, et cetera, whatever the camels are used for. And then they become feral and they now are out of space because they're not in the right spaces of human control. And they're also out of time because that time is running out for them and they're being um, they're being um, culled, culled, slaughtered, killed, whatever words you, you want to talk about it. I mean, Michelle talks about power words quite a lot. Um, but yes, we do these boundaries, as you were saying, Tom, they just moved. We move the goalposts all the time, don't we? Whatever sources. Well, you know, what, what you're saying is important, I think, because there's also uh, a heady debate in the world right now about the differences between immigrants and refugees. Um, and, and I think a lot of the animal stories that we're telling here are really about refugees. Um, about motion based on need or forced motion that um, uh, uh, leaves you in a very different category in the new place in which you arrive. Um, And uh, whether it's for humans or for for um, non-humans, I think that that push factor and how you get to that second place matters just as much for your categorization as it does where you end up. Uh, so I think I think you're absolutely right. I mean, rewilding is something um, that is obviously uh, who's involved in rewilding here. Anybody? Oh, a little bit with the you know the reintroduction of orphaned wildlife in Nepal. We've done some rewilding. I'm glad that you you brought that up because you know this whole uh, divide, this whole nature culture divide, I think is so important when we're talking about. Uh, immigrants and migration because as Tom said you know we've built these boundaries and uh, one of the ways we've done that is by so separating ourselves from this concept of of nature that almost doesn't make sense Uh, and there's this uh, there's a you know I love I love some Tim Ingold Ingold in my life and uh, Tim Ingold said that the concept of nature like that of society is inherently and intensely political and I think that's so very true because if you use the word nature or natural, you know, those animals are in their natural habitat or naturalistic uh, exhibits in zoos. You know, anytime we're um, forcing an animal into a situation, we're defining nature and nature itself is just such a, a heavy concept with so many political and social, so much baggage attached to it that I think it's important that we we bear that in mind, you know, nature is culturally and historically specific. So what we think of as, as now as, as natural is very different than what it was 10 years ago. Well, I don't know if anybody's read the Stephen Helmreich um, paper, how scientists think about natives. Um, and it talks about uh, uh, biologists of aliens who, who are um, categorizing alien species in uh, Hawaii. And that's absolutely fascinating. Um, I definitely recommend it to be read if nobody has read it. But native means different things to different people all the time. And especially as human um, settlers, the original human settlers introduced species at the same time. And then Captain Cook introduced species. And some of those introduced species are are now considered native, even though if you go back in time, what is native? It changes constantly and regularly. And we seem to we seem to be in a world where we want to just put a, a timestamp. This right now is how it should be or how it shouldn't be, because we should go back to 
Well, what should we go back to? What what time? I don't Doesn't know. Doesn't that apply to the to human immigration as well? I mean, if we're so we're, we're living in a, a culture here in the U.S. of of an anti-immigrant government, and yet all of us obviously were immigrants to this country at some point, and so why is it okay right now that we stop other people from coming here when we think it was okay that we came here? Oh, what you were saying there with the uh, rewilding, it got me thinking a little bit about um, like landscape management. And uh, where I'm from, I'm, so I'm from Brighton in, in the UK. And so it's a coastal town, only got granted sit, uh, like a city status by combining two different towns together. Like we don't have a cathedral. We have nothing that makes us a city other than the fact it's a nice tourist destination. Um, so they kind of merged these two towns together, made it into a city, and then but there's no infrastructure to allow for the for the amount of people that actually come through through the city. So our green spaces are becoming more and more kind of sacred. Um, and there's a a strip of green greenery behind um, where I grew up. And it's it's farmland that has just kind of turned to nothing. So people walk it to like use it to walk their dog sorry um but there's this strip of of woodland and a couple of years ago the local council decided that it would be better to use this in a more and more natural way so what they did is they ripped down most of the trees um and they said that they wouldn't rip down oak trees because oak trees are protected but they did and they took down these oak trees, they put up these fences, and then they filled these areas with sheep. Their idea being that they wanted to encourage grassland like it was in the Victorian times. And this grassland would promote species biodiversity because it would bring insect life. And I remember walking my dog with my dad and I was really upset that they'd torn down all these trees. And to me, it had gone from being extremely natural to, you know, you didn't know you were in a city, to suddenly you can see the landscape, you can see the city on either side. And I would be quite upset by this. And I was like, but why did they pick the Victorian time? Like they could have gone a hundred years before that and it would have been woodland. They could have gone a hundred years before that, it would have been something else. So at what point did you decide that this is, this is justifiable? Like you could have just picked an era out of a hat and then started managing the land accordingly. And of course it wasn't. It was that they wanted somewhere to put their sheep. So ah, okay. I thought it maybe because it was romantic or something. But Well, that's interesting yeah. because, again, we're back to that the control, you know, the, the power and the control of, of separating that, that nature and culture. We have to confine nature to these green spaces and fence them in so that we can put nature there in this case, the sheep and the grasslands, we're going to put nature over there and keep culture over here. And when we run into trouble, the problem animals, the problem immigrant animals is when one of them transgresses that nature culture border, you know, and uh, here in the U.S., I think it's, I love pigeons. I I adore pigeons. And uh, here in the the U.S., there's been a long-term sort of uh, attack on on pigeons. Uh, I remember reading in that the New York Times has about a 155 year history of portraying pigeons as transgressors in the city. And um, they're the ones that came up with this, this rats with wings stigma that uh, pigeons have. And they sort of increased public anxiety about pigeon health, uh, pigeons affecting human health. And they, they created this, um, this transgressive species out of, out of animals that, you know, are very well adapted to living in human spaces. And it was because they crossed that, that boundary you know they they went from nature into culture and it uh created problems and i i think it's interesting in that uh you know my history is in in literature it's interesting that our word choices are so indicative of how we want to frame the narrative so we use words like incursions you know wild animals make incursions into croplands um we use words like noxious or ravenous you know if a, if a predator comes onto farmland it's a ravenous predator uh so we control using these words we control our our narrative of immigrant animals 
and and also and also on the on the side of the way that we 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 see um, animals um, and time um, is that I often see uh, meat um, advertised in the UK specifically as um, British meat. You know, it's, it's, it's meat that belongs to Britain somehow. Um, when you stop thinking about it, you, it makes you think how. But pigs were actually introduced to the UK, uh, domestic pigs, eight and a half thousand years ago. But now they're considered native animals in the UK. But if we had wild boar in the UK, who maybe maybe they were introduced or weren't introduced in a, in a hypothetical situation, because they are not being used and controlled, would it would they be considered native, native or would they be considered just a pest, like you, you were saying about the, the, the pigeons? Um, and, it, yeah, it, it's interesting how we... Uh, so the and of course pigs we're only interested in them in terms of generally in society in terms of a product to eat we're not interested interested in an individual pig you know like tom is interested in his individual pigs who have personalities of course all pigs have personalities but we're interested in this pride having this pride in this with this animal who is alive but it's a native then it's a native dead body that we're we're interested in um whereas animals that we're interested in as native live bodies are animals such as the beaver being reintroduced. So they were in, they were part of British landscape, um, considered to be pests, transgressing, you know, making problems, problems with uh, waterways, etc. And now they're, oh, we actually, they're back in fashion. So, and that, but they're alive on a live body. So we have, we, we seem to have this this ability to uh, a, a dead human non-human animal is we have pride in that but if it should be alive we have no pride in that we have it becomes um it's it's agency is the problem not its actual body well it's right. interesting you brought up the british beef as being sort of a, a bragging point but here in the u.s when you say british beef we cringe you know because we're still we're still living in the fear of mad cow from britain you know so we have the USDA I, beef. <laughs> uh, I hear beef, I cringe no matter what the what oh. the time. Um, uh, you know, it's interesting that you you talk about this though, because the one thing all of those examples have in common is that we're gauging that that value based on human assumptions. And I know we've been bagging on humans this whole time, and they deserve it. But th sometimes those definitions and that rewilding and those notions can be positive. So I'm thinking in particular, when we talk about uh, crossing boundaries and becoming versions of immigrants. I'm thinking in particular of the, the trend in parts of Europe and Asia right now to build these um, uh, walkways over interstates where they are uh, natural, grassy, to try to convince the animals uh, from the, the woods on either side of the road to go over. And of course, that is not really for their benefit. It's so that cars don't hit them and cause humans problems. And yet it does help in this, in this case. It actually is beneficial uh, to animals and aids immigration by getting them across that boundary from one place to another safely. So, uh, I think we tend to find, like in, like in Sarah's example, I think we tend to find that these things can benefit animals, but when it does, it tends to be ancillary. <laughs> it tends to be an ancillary runoff of what is supposed to benefit humans. And only when those interests align does it help animals. But that is one example, I think, of animal immigration that has been aided by humans successfully, that, um, that, that does help and that does kind of alleviate some of the problems that we've created with our roads. Really yeah. interesting you say that about the um, about the the pathways that go across um, roads. So um, when I was an undergrad we were looking at this phenomenon and it was just becoming uh, more and more kind of popular and what they originally tried um, in several places um, particularly in Europe was like you say they wanted to stop these animals causing collisions with vehicles so what they did is they built tunnels underneath highways 
Oh. Um, but what they found, and it was only actually when ecologists were very much in favour of this because they want they didn't want to have these species bottlenecks. They wanted uh, these fragmented habitats to to join up. So it was for the animals' benefit. They wanted to know why are the animals not using them. And it was only when they did study they put um, sand all along the entrance to these tunnels and what they found is a huge amount of different species were coming into these these tracks so they were placing their their feet onto the sand but they were never then they would just turn back around and go again and so the more they studied these they're like why is it that the animals are approaching these tunnels but they're seeing the tunnel and they're literally turning around and going back again even though we know that they're in need of the resources that are on the other side and it turned out that most of the animals are um, have very specialised vision. So to put them in a position where they can't see the other side, mm. they're just going into to the unknown. They're going into the abyss. So it was so frightening to them. And obviously all the sounds in there echo and they, they're going into this very unsafe place. So they were literally going, oh, no, can't deal with that. And then just turning around and, and fleeing. So actually, it was then from the ecologist's point of view and the conservationist's point of view, they were like, it's all very well and good that it's stopping the, the road accidents, you say, but actually it's not because they're still preferring to go over the road and risk the traffic than mm -hmm. go into the dark tunnel. And that's when we started seeing the rise in the overhead uh -huh. um, and pathways, which, yeah. So oh, I like the idea that it might have started from a human uh, centric point of view but actually we we do have there's a few of us out there <laughs> like no 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 well, this doesn't work. <laughs> they did learn the lesson in florida because when they were building the new highways down here uh they actually radio collared we have very endangered florida panthers they're they're found nowhere else in the world and uh so they radio collared them prior to building the highway so that they could actually pick the paths where the, the um, panthers were already traveling to build those underground pathways because they've, they've had that problem in the past as well, that the animals don't use the passageways that are built for them. So they actually solved the problem here and were able to go under the highways. Uh, but it did make me think of Christmas Island. I don't know if you've ever watched the videos of the Christmas Island crabs. Uh, millions and millions of crabs go from the forest to the shore once a year. And so what they have done is built these huge overpasses uh, and they have what look like um, bumpers, like if you were playing, if you were bowling, bumpers that all the crabs kind of run into the bumpers and are funneled onto these bridges and go over because they were, I mean, millions of crabs crossing one road is crazy. So they uh, built these overpasses that the crabs use every year. And um, one of the reasons being uh, was tourism because people wanted to see this crab migration uh, and in order to bring in more tourists, they had to save the crabs. And so it became uh, worthwhile. It became useful to humans to build these overpasses. Uh, and that's why I think that they were successful in doing so because it did serve human needs. It's nice though that there's that positive outcome. And it reminds me of uh, Haraway and trying to see things in a positive light and not view the Anthropocene as this kind of us versus them and we're ruining the world. And yes, there might be ulterior motives like the profit made from ecotourism, but if it works, it works. If it can benefit both parties, then I'm all for it. Well, how do we change? Sorry, I was gonna say, how do we change? I mean, it seems like the media is blasting constantly that invasion, um, damage, um, not natural, all of this. How do, how do we change that? Or how, do, how is that changed if we can't change it? How, because that, that has the most damage if we're, it can, it's brainwashing us in, as, a, as societies into seeing things negatively, like you were saying. You know, Michelle was talking about the fact that to study how the effects of uh, those changes in Florida work, that they were, you know, chipping the animals and tracking them and co or collaring them or doing something to make sure that they could track all the animals. And so even when you're doing something for the benefit of the animals, you're still evincing a, a, um, a natural 
um, and artificial divide. I mean, you're still creating this thing to where even the people who are trying to benefit these animals will always see them as separate and as other because just to be able to study them, they're having to do the chipping or to do the whatever else. And um, at that point, there's just no way for most people to, to make that leap. I mean, they can barely do it with humans who they're immigrants who are there trying to track as moving through a country. Uh, we certainly in the US have that problem right now where, where a government wants to track all of these immigrants and put them in cages and to do the kinds of ugly, horrible things that we're doing right now. And it's because they can't see immigrants as legitimate people. And that is because of how they track them from where they're coming from or whatever else. And as long as the only way for us to study animal migrations is to, to use that kind of scientific uh, stamp, which is, which is good, I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it does create this form of othering simply because of the nature of tracking. I think that's gonna be a, a really hard thing for a broader, non-anthrozoologist population to, to really get their heads around, I think. I think it's probably very much like, um, like the label that Chris was um, talking about um, before the show, expats and immigrants. Uh, maybe you want to talk a bit more about that, Chris, your thoughts on it. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, I, I consider myself an, an immigrant. In the, I lived in the US for 10 years. I was born in Britain um, and now I live in Germany. So essentially, I'm an immigrant. Um, I reject the term expat because in my mind, it implies somebody who is just living in a bubble. They're not really living in their new country. They're more seeing it as a, a little England that they've brought with them. Um, so, so I own the word immigrant um, because that's essentially what I am. I, I was not born here. I don't have a, a German passport yet. Um, but sometimes when I have conversations, um, sort of well in the US, and then when I'm I'm back in the UK, and sometimes it can get sort of a little bit. It's sort of taking that slightly anti-immigrant turn. Um, and if I'm feeling confident, I like to then point out that I'm an immigrant and because it makes people squirm. It makes them uncomfortable because suddenly their first reaction is often, oh, but not you. And by forcing them to think, why not me? It makes them sort of realize that that anti-immigrant stance often has this um, slightly racist or um, xenophobic or, or it's against certain certain types of people which is is problematic and 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 yeah it always comes down to who 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 we define as belonging and not belonging um, and I was reading yes yeah, so we're preparing for this podcast I stumbled across this article it's over 20 years old now but it looked at some of the the public discourses surrounding um, immigration in the US and, and they looked at how it was presented in the media and some of the social discourses and one of the prominent um, metaphors for, for the, this group of immigrants was, was animal. Um, and it was problematic from, from the human perspective and how we, we treat humans, but it also says a lot about how we think about animals because it was used by both sides of the argument. So we there was um, discourses that kind of implied that these immigrants were less than human, they were animal. Um, but then from the other side, it was they were being treated like animals. So in both ways, from both sides, we're sort of, it, it shows how we treat animals poorly and how we think of animals poorly. Um, and also how we treat humans as well. Uh, so yeah, I found that, that really interesting. And yeah, the, the article was talking about basically immigrants as animals. We extend that language out too, right? Because um, anti-immigration people refer to an infestation. I mean, we use the, I mean, we very much use that same language. We, we borrow the relatively bigoted language that we use to talk about animals and just map it on to new bigoted ways to talk about humans. And, and we forth. also, we also flip it the other way too, that the, the uh, pro um, pro immigration or pro family you know, bringing families back together language is, you know, the kids in cages. 
get the kids out of cages. We use that same sort of um, animal liberation language, um, which is, is obviously necessary right. because we do have these uh, immigrants in cages in um, enclosures so that they don't um, incur, you know, make incursions into our, our lives, which is really horrifying for, from, well, I'm hoping that everyone is horrified by it. But sadly, you know, now that I'm, I'm living in Florida. 73 I really million people, Michelle, 73, 73 million people here are not horrified by it. Apparently. It's, it blows my mind. It blows my mind that, um, that we're still using this, this othering, you know, creating, creating others um, so that we have some control over our, our personal situation, which is terrible. But back to what Chris was saying too, it's all about, um, it's all about what you look like. You know, if, if uh, I meet a British immigrant, uh, generally people will be, oh, you're from Britain, how exciting, and you've got a great accent and this and that. Um, and yet if it was another immigrant from Pakistan, then, oh, you're from Pakistan. You know, it it's, depends on where you're, where you're from. And I think the same is very true with, with the animals because uh, Tom was talking about his wild boar. You know, we've got a wild boar problem here in Florida, feral hogs that have escaped from um, human control and uh, now wander and they're dangerous at night and people hunt them down. Um, and yet we've got other invasive species that are, you know, kind of accepted and they're cute and adorable. So it's all about your, uh, your personal characteristics, whether or not you're an accepted immigrant or not. Uh, and, I, and actually, I mean, you, you said it's about what, what you look like. If we talk, if we talk, if we talk about some, um... Uh, again, from animals being um, moved from rescue animals being moved from one location to another around the world across some kind of um, country defined boundary. Um, in my in my view, from the work that I do here, I, I would I would agree with Tom that a lot of them are called refugees because the the, the environment that they're in here right now, the ones that the animals that we generally deal with are ones that have been injured quite ba badly enough to be, not be able to survive on, in, on the streets. They've been injured, they've been taken, they've been cared for, and they're moved from one place to another. And I know that ha happens in a lot, a lot of places around the world. And a lot of animals are, seem to be moved pretty much from the east, um, Middle East and Thailand, I'm thinking specifically, because I know about those, over to the west, UK, Europe, and America and Canada. Um, and of course, dogs look pretty much the same, you could say, generally, when they're moved, you know, from one part of the world to the other. I know there are some differences, but you couldn't see, you couldn't say um, if you met a dog on the street in the UK or America, oh, I know exactly where you're from, you, you know, that kind of thing, if they're a Mongol. But when somebody says it's, it creates a lot of tension with a lot of people and it makes me wonder exactly what you were saying, Michelle, if it's a xenoph if it, if it parallels the xenophobia people have, why are you helping animals from other countries? Why don't you help the ones that are in our country that are in homes, etc.? And people, people don't seem to take into account the, the situation those animals are living in, the, 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 the environment they're living in, just the same as we don't take into account humans that are get moving or because they have to, need to, want to, from one area to another. And, um, and on the other side, from experts, when you're saying people living in a little bubble, Chris, um, I'm, as you know, I'm um, be, live, be, move, be living in, uh, in a different country in Europe pretty soon. And I've noticed a lot of people who move across to that country, uh, from the UK specifically, always talking about dogs barking. Yet the dogs are already in that country. It's their culture that it's a human culture as well. That dogs are out barking, you know, having nighttime um, conversations with whoever's out there. And yet the expats or the people who possibly consider themselves expats and not immigrants, they are they are disturbed by that, even though they're the ones moving from one place to another. And going back to what you're saying, Tom, before, how do we people don't seem to be able to make the leap into thinking beyond the, 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 the boundaries that they've got in their own minds. And I, that's, if we can solve that, we, we can solve lots. It's like that old saying, uh, the forest isn't on either side of the road. We built the road through the forest, right? I mean, so, uh, and people don't really acknowledge that. Right. Yeah. Well, and that's so. what makes me think, you know, all of the invasive species here in Florida did not just arrive in Florida of their own accord. You know, the iguanas, 
were brought in. The anole lizards were brought in. The pythons were brought in. The the monkeys brought in. You know, these are not uh, these are not animals that immigrated of their own. And yet now people are complaining about the number of these animals that have, have taken over. And yet it's a completely human driven immigration. You know, it's it's you know, we're responsible for the invasion. And yet, like you said, we complain about it, even though it's our own fault. Yeah, I think invasion is a good word. I don't think there's any way to, to, to get out of a conversation about animal immigration without talking about the concept of invasive uh, species and the con uh, just the idea of something being invasive uh, in general. Um, because there, it really does tie back to the way we describe humans uh, in a variety of ways. And I, I understand that from an ecological standpoint uh, that there are certain species that uh, are separate from others for a variety of evolutionary reasons. But um, to consider someone uh, invasive simply because they've transgressed a line, whether it be, be of their own accord or because humans put them there um, is fraught to say the least. There's a new book out uh, by C.S. Elton called The Ecology of Invasions by Animals and Plants. And he s uses the expression outburst. And um, because he says that that's exactly what happens. It's an ecological explosion. Anytime you have a, a new species in an area. And I think that that's the that's where the fear comes from, is this, this explosion, this out of control. Um, and he said that a lot of the, the issues with these, these ex animal explosions is that it, they force people to migrate. And people don't want to migrate, you know, unless it's their choice. And so a lot of these problems with, you know, malaria causing people to move, the potato fungus uh, in Ireland that forced people to, to emigrate, uh, these are all... Um, explosions of plants or animals that that forced human migrations and uh, that's why humans got very upset about them. I think that's a really interesting point and when we're thinking about trying to break down those kind of us versus them dichotomies um, I wanted to bring in a paper from 2007. Um, it uses the word immigrants for uh, dispersal patterns of animals. And I found it so interesting because it says here, little is known about the fitness of immigrants relative to residents once they have settled. However, some empirical studies show that at least in some cases, immigrants may perform better than residents. Does that not just sum up the whole way that immigrants are viewed? And I think that's why when we're talking about the media narratives and the language employed, that's why people don't want to use that term refugee. They want to use the term immigrant. And it's that threat. And maybe that threat is, is biological in us to some degree. And I found it even when I'm traveling to places where, say, for example, I was traveling around Ireland for, for a year and people were a bit not quite sure because I've got a very strong southern British accent um but as soon as I say oh yeah but my family is is from Ireland and that's my heritage then suddenly I'm accepted and so I've actually had the experience on the other you know on the other side where I found it easier to be accepted because I'm then considered one of them um but yeah I just thought it was interesting how this term immigrant was used in a biological sense and just highlighting the fact that there is this very ingrained fear. What if these people, what if these animals can flourish in an environment that we were born in and they do it better than we do? Is that going to be some kind of threat? And that's exactly the kind of xenophobic language that has been, it was used for the, the uh, I'm going to say the word Brexit, for the, for the Brexit campaign with the pictures of, of lines of people queued up, cut, you know, supposedly coming across from, um, from Turkey, um, if Turkey were to join the EU, that fear, it was absolutely 100% used. And yeah, and that propaganda is extremely uh, dangerous because the, the photograph that I think I'm 
the the one I think you're describing um, was an exact take, an exact replica of um, uh, the situation in Germany and the Jews. And so it was the exact same propaganda that was used. And they actually darkened the skin of the people in that image. Um, so there's all sorts of horrendous things that are wrong with that propaganda. But I see some some similarities there in the ways that the media portray certain certain an- animal immigrants, like foxes in the UK, urban foxes are considered to be um, stealthy and dangerous and cunning and sly. And these are all nasty names that we give to them, whereas actually we could completely reframe that and say they're, they're opportunistic, they are intelligent, they are... They are witty. There's lots of ways that we could reframe that narrative to be one of respect, but we're scared that they are going to flourish in an environment that we don't want them in. I actually use this article with my students all the time. That's cultural representations of problems, problem animals and National Geographic, because National Geographic is sort of the gold standard of accessible science, right? People rely on National Geographic. And so they did a study of the trends of National Geographic in the words and the images that they used. And they found, uh, first, interestingly, that the National Geographic started mentioning uh, anthropogenic pressures in 1908. I mean, so that far back, they were dealing with it. And they've, they've sort of kept up that theme, you know, for the last more than 100 years, which is interesting. But back in the uh, 20s and 30s, they framed the narrative as... Um, our, our interest in nature. They use words like the, the um, suspicious tiger or the curious or the, the fascinated. They would use these words, these anthropomorphic words that sort of uh, sounded like we were interested in nature. And then they changed the narrative and they started representing wolves and coyotes and other predators as ravenous and dangerous and outlaw. They started using these words, um, uh, you know, pirate, they referred to animals as, as pirates and scourge, and they'd, they'd call them, the, oh, it was matted in blood. Um, and it was at this point in the, the 40s that this human as, as rescuer rope appeared. Uh, and then what they saw happen is that after World War II, this wildlife preservation um, and animal ecology idea really started to take hold and reshape the narratives. Um, and it, it became confusing because they would refer to animals as pests, but then they would also refer to them as amazing creatures. You know, they were intruders, but then humans were also the invaders. So they started trying to, to fight with this balance of, of this nature culture boundary. So um, even this, this highly respected magazine was, was reframing the narrative to fit their own views using words to influence cultural perceptions. That um, that is actually a, a, a reification of what happens in the 19th century, when um, you know when when we had when colonists over here in the U.S. Um, talked about nature, they didn't talk about nature. They talked about wilderness. They talked about something that was wild. That was it was a place where the dangerous animals were. It was a place where the natives were. Um, depending on where you were, it was a place where the French were. And all of those groups were anathema to the, the settlers over here. Dangerous animals, dangerous Indians, dangerous Frenchmen. And they called it wilderness. The woods were wilderness. That doesn't really start to change until the transcendentalists come along and Henry David Thoreau and them begin to talk about the beauty of nature and that you can go and commune with nature and you can go into the woods and find something quasi spiritual or whatever. That's really the first time that we see those boundaries, human animal boundaries redefined, at least over here. Um, And it is, I think notably, not with offense, but with a name change. What you know, when people stop calling the woods wilderness and they start calling it nature, um, uh, and then that I guess gets redone again in the twentieth century. Well, and I think that that wilderness goes all the way back to 
to biblical times. So those of us who are from a Judeo-Christian background, I mean, if you were if you were cast out, you were cast out into the wilderness. You know, it was a place of um, terror and and loneliness. And I think it goes back that far, this sense of um, being afraid of what's out there. And I think really another change happened um, during the Roosevelt era when there was this uh, this American dream of conquering the wilderness. And we had to go uh, out there and settle things, settle the wilderness, take it under our control, you know, build national parks so that we could control them. And um, that became this, this American struggle to overtake wilderness. Yeah. That doesn't always work though, does it? I mean, uh, 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 Jess and I were at a conference this week where there was an incredibly interesting paper about artificial borders being created between humans and nature. And yet the migrants in this particular story were the trees, uh, were the forest itself. And so um, I think uh, uh, that kind of immigration across these boundary lines that we create can happen in a variety of different contexts outside of the human. And even, even with trees who we think of as relatively stationary can also spread beyond the borders which we create for them. And so the quote unquote natural world or the wilderness uh, can certainly creep into uh, human as assumed um, spaces. One of the things I love, ways. sorry. One of the things I love is we drive to this particular place to go to the desert just for a bit of peace and quiet. It's not very far away. And there's a particular road where a sand dune is, is always trying to cross the road. And we'll go and sometimes it'll be a little bit and the next it'll be half. And then it'll be, it'll never get to more than three quarters because something comes along and puts it back again. And then you go next time and it'll just be creeping and creeping. And there's some fantastic um, photographs um, of the empty quarter in Saudi where parts of the road have been taken by these moving sand dunes are absolutely amazing. And I love the thought that, you know, we might be slow, but we're going to keep going and we're going to get it back. <laughs> I do like that. Yeah. That I wanted to bring up animals that are confiscated, you know, that, that were forcibly brought into a country uh, and illegally and are then confiscated. And um, there's this thought that by taking these animals, we are doing the right thing. We're saving them. Um, but sadly, what happens is that a lot of time, I mean, here's a quote, maybe the animals would choose to remain with the traffickers if they knew what sort of conditions they were going to be kept in. Um, because the problem is CITES does not require the tracking of animals that are confiscated. So, for example, between uh, 2010 and 2014, there were 64,000 animals confiscated. About 19% of those are threatened species, okay? No tracking. So CITES has no idea where these 64,000 individual animals have gone. Um, and so most of them are seized at the site of import as opposed to the site of export, which means that there's no real idea of where these animals came from, no idea where to return them to. Uh, and the reason that this was playing in my mind with these animals as, as immigrants is because my last field work in Nepal, I happened to um, be talking to someone and saw that there were two chimpanzees in a very small cage, maybe two by four foot cage, two um, one-year-old chimpanzees. And I asked, you know, why are there chimpanzees here in this little tiny cage? And I was told that they had been seized. Um, they had been brought in from Nairobi, I think they said. Uh, and they really had no idea what was going to happen to them because the, the smuggler was in jail waiting for a court hearing. And it had been a year and a half. So these two, um, or a year, I guess, these two young chimpanzees had been infants when they were put in this little tiny cage and they were still waiting. Um, and it looked like they were going to be in there for another year. Um, and so that's why I started to look up some of this data about these you know, animal kidnappings, essentially. And um, they found that it's hard to release these animals anyway, because not knowing the mental trauma that happened when they were captured, especially since a lot of them are infants, 
um, and not knowing the physical trauma that's happened and not knowing if they've had any socialization, if he were to rewild them, there is the potential that they will simply starve to death or die a very slow death. So I feel like we have this um, sort of responsibility to these these animals that we've that we've kidnapped um, to find out what's going on with them. So there are again sixty four thousand refugee animals essentially sitting in some sort of an enclosure. Um, there's the assumption that a lot of them end up back in illegal trade or dead. Um, so I just wanted to kind of touch on that, you know, where it's a, it's a $10 billion industry, wildlife trafficking. So where do we, where do we go from there? How do we, uh, how do we help these animals? I mean, there were something like 50,000 flying squirrels removed from Florida and sold to South Korea. Uh, nobody noticed. Until, you know, it was like 40 years and they, they realized that, oh, look, all these flying squirrels have been moved. Um, so, yeah, I just kind of wanted to talk about that, our responsibilities to these um, asylum seekers, these refugees. You know, what do we do? And on another, another side of that with CITES, maybe we could do a, public, a podcast on CITES. Um, I, I basically um, became the, the tortoise rescuer on the, on the compound that I lived on. And uh, people were buying them from pet shops, um, feeling sorry for them because they were all climbing on top of each other, bringing them onto the compound. And over the years, they were multiplying them. People were leaving and not taking them. And I ended up with 14 of them. So I spent two years trying to get CITES paperwork to take them with me, to be a responsible person, to make sure they'd be looked after properly, et cetera, et cetera. And I got no response from the authorities and could not get the paperwork Fortunately, I'd started early enough, so I ended up putting them somewhere that it's it's good enough. You know, it's not it's not abandoning them, and people they won't be given lettuce for the rest of their lives. I hope, but I absolutely it's a broken system, CITES, from what I've seen. But anyway, thinking I have a very very similar story. Um, so when you're talking about our moral moral obligation to to animals that have been displaced uh, and trafficked. Um, so I did a study in uh, Mexico City and I was helping another researcher and we were going to people's homes where they had pet spider monkeys. And the way that nine out of ten of these stories are the same, what happens is um, where the spider monkeys are in the wild, they're often hunted for food. The mother is killed uh, for, for the meal, and then the infant is prized from the dead body and sold on the side of the road. So truckers that are going up and down the country will, and who are ultimately heading towards the largest cities, in this case, Mexico City, they will pick up the infant from the side of the road for not very much money. They'll then transport it maybe three, four days on the road um, in just awful conditions, it will then enter the black market being sold um, in, yeah, again, horrific conditions. People see them in these uh, nasty conditions. They see that they're, if they're alive, then it's barely so. They feel sorry for them. They're also unbelievably cute. I mean, neoteny is an understatement. They've got these big, beautiful eyes, round faces. They, they look like teeny tiny little babies um, because I guess they are so they get taken into people's homes but just like most uh, primates they're not getting their needs met they become severely aggressive once they meet reach sexual maturity they can't be housed anymore um, so there was a few that I would visit in the city and at first it broke my heart because they're in like one of them was in a cage that was probably the size of like an old British telephone box. And this is a full grown spider monkey. They also have the same intelligence levels as chimpanzees. So they're extremely intelligent and it had a chain attached to its neck and it just, it couldn't go anywhere. Um, horrible, horrible, horrible conditions. And I asked the researcher, I was like, why don't you, you know, the study is over, you've got your data, why don't you report them, why don't you? And of course there was the ethical considerations in that this person had volunteered to take part in the study. And it, from their perspective, that's their companion animal. But more so, it was for the perspective of the primate 
and the confiscation centres available in Mexico City are where every single confiscated animal goes. So you would end up with a spider monkey housed next to a crocodile, housed next to, do you see what I mean? So it's just so many different animals that are all crowded together with different needs that aren't being met. And they're actually going from one stressful situation that they have known the majority of their lives and they're used to, to a situation where they're ultimately going to die of neglect or shock. So from an ethical standpoint, maybe we have more um, moral obligation to keep them where they are because it's the worst of two evils. And that made me think again of this, um, this idea of the pseudo sanctuary. And this is something else I encountered a lot was people that have land and suddenly they were getting these animals donated to them left, right and center. And so they're like, okay, I guess I've, I've got these animals and I can't reintroduce them. So I guess I'll just look after them as best I can. But then they give themselves this name of a sanctuary but the animals in there, they are psychologically damaged. They cannot interact with their own species. They cannot survive without human care. But suddenly we've got this, this massive population of potentially endangered or critically endangered species where these individuals, from a conservation point of view, mean nothing. Yeah. And so we've just got all these individuals that can't be helped because all of the funding that's going to go to that species is for the conservation of that species. But we don't know where they come from, so we don't know what their genetics are. They can't survive in the wild. Ultimately, they are not of any conservation value. And so they're not counted. Mm. And I just think that's such a shame. And it just promotes more and more of this uh, inequality, even within a group of or within a, a program of trying to, to help animals. Well, I think that we focus on saving the animal body. We don't focus on saving the animal mind. And when you have a primate that was torn from its parent at a very early age, or a, a pachyderm torn from a parent at a very early age, there is a lot of trauma, a lot of PTSD that needs to be dealt with. And if you um, are only focused with saving the animal body then you're sacrificing the animal mind and i think we're seeing that in human um, immigration as well in that we're so focused on keeping the bodies out that we are not taking into account the damage that we are doing to the the minds especially of, of children uh who are who are stuck in the immigration process you know we're we're much too focused on the where their body is Maybe if they became citizens, that the, these issues then could be addressed. And I think the next podcast we're going to do, or one in the future, is going to be about animals and citizens. Well, thanks for joining us, everybody. And we'll see you next time on the Anthropology Podcast. Bye.